Thank you so much, Oko, and thank you all of you for coming along today. So um, my epigraph is from Derrida, from his Ulysses gramophone, where he says, in the beginning was the telephone. We can hear the telephone constantly ringing, this coup de telephone which plays on figures that are apparently random, but about which there is so much to say. Since its first publication in The New Yorker in 1948, Nabokov's short story, Signs and Symbols, has become one of his most critically celebrated, if famously cryptic, tales. This is largely due to a suggestion that Nabokov made to his editor, Catherine A. White, that the story contains an encoded meaning. As Nabokov famously explained, Signs and Symbols and The Vain Sisters are two texts in which a second main story is woven into or placed behind the superficial, semi-transparent one. But while Nabokov also famously divulged the secret of the Vain Sisters as an acrostic message encrypted in the first letters of each sentence in the final paragraph, which reads as icicles by Cynthia meter from me, Sybil, the second main story of signs and symbols remains as yet undeciphered, despite the best efforts of the critical tradition. The critical detective work focuses on the identity behind the third telephone call. As is well known, signs and symbols ends with three phone calls. There are two wrong numbers and then a third unanswered call that rings off the tail. In the first two calls, a girl's dull little voice asks to speak to Charlie. Crucially, however, the third caller remains a mystery. Are we to understand this as the same young woman trying again despite having her dialing error already explained to her by the mother? She says, I will tell you what you are doing. You are turning the letter O instead of the zero and therefore dialing a wrong number. Or is it a missed message from the hospital informing the parents about their son's successful suicide this time? Is it a call from the couple's son himself, perhaps, who has escaped from the hospital and is now on the run? Or, as in Alexander Dolanin's ingenious reading, is it a ciphered message of reassurance coming from the now dead son calling in from the other world through the encoded number six? It's a, it's a very intriguing uh, reading that Dolanin suggests for, for, this, for this mystery. One should recall, though, that Nabokov himself had little patience for reading methods that treat words and images merely as signs pointing towards a secondary symbolic meaning. Reviewing W. W. Rowe's Nabokov's Deceptive World, which came out in 1971, Nabokov is ferocious in his critique. He writes, the various words that Mr. Rowe mistakes for the symbols of academic jargon supposedly planted by an idiotically sly novelist to keep scholars busy, and not labels, not pointers, and certainly not the garbage cans of a Viennese tenement, but live fragments of specific description, rudiments of metaphor, and echoes of creative emotion. And the notion of symbol itself has always been abhorrent to me, he informs us. Now, if we leave aside for a moment the implied reference to Joyce, it is Nabokov's characterization of Freud, the clear occupant of the Viennese tenement, as exemplifying this detested symbolic mode of reading that I wish to pursue initially. For in its claim to detect in one's ordinary speech an encoded message about what polite society throws out, namely sex, psychoanalysis seems to be the worst offender of this type of over-reading, and certainly Nabokov's repudiation of Freud is legendary. All throughout his essays and his novels, Nabokov takes enormous delight at poking fun at the Austrian crank with the shabby umbrella. His novels are peppered with thinly veiled uh, Freudian symbols, which Nabokov then also mockingly points out to readers. We must remember, Humbert Humbert advises, that a pistol is the Freudian symbol of the Ur father's central forelimb. But what I'd like to explore here is what happens if Nabokov's Baroque anti-psychoanalytic posturings 
turned out to have been a distraction, a magician's trick, as it were, designed to focus attention away from what he and Freud, as well as Jacques Lacan, have in common. For it's not only their mutual interest in sex, and especially that nicest science, incest, that they share. It is also, as that anagram, which of course comes from Ada, uh, suggests, Freud's and Nabokov's central investment in language as the site of puns, of double meanings, of homophony, of jokes, indeed of writing itself as the material inscription of letters. Given these significant points of intersection, how are we to account for Nabokov's legendary antipathy to the talking cure? Now, in his perceptive discussion of this relation, Leland de la, de la Durantai remarks on the crucial difference of their respective styles. He observes that while Nabokov and Freud are equally fascinated with the particularities of the individual, psychoanalysis is driven to subsume them within larger overarching narratives such as the family romance. And because of this tendency, Freudian psychoanalysis would be anathema to a writer for whom the essence of art dwells in the details. Accordingly, in Nabokov's opinion, psychoanalysis, quote, has something very Bolshevik about it. There is an inner policing, symbols killing the individual dream, the thing itself. And admittedly, I have to admit, some of Freud's sta statements in his lecture on the dream work do read as bad caricatures. It's not only the pistol, we learn, that represents the male genital, genital, as Freud puts it in the 10th lecture from his 1920 lecture series, A General Introduction to Psychoanalysis, through which Nabokov may in fact have first encountered the Viennese quack's work, but various other objects do as well, forming a compendium of phallic dream symbols, which Freud lists, lists as follows. Right. So in the first place, this is Freud from his 10th lecture, the holy figure three is a symbolical substitute for the entire male genital. And the more conspicuous and more interesting part of the genital to both sexes, the male organ, has symbolical substitute in objects of like form, those which are long and upright, such as sticks, umbrellas, poles, trees, etc. It is also symbolized by objects that have the characteristic in common with it of penetration into the body and consequent injury Hence, pointed weapons of every type, knives, daggers, lances, swords, and in the same manner, firearms, guns, pistols, and the revolver, which is so suitable because of its shape, says Freud. Freud goes on to explain that these symbolic objects include a, num a number of other representatives whose attributes are also evidently shared with the male member. Faucets, water cans, fountains, as well as its representation by other objects that have the power of elongation, such as hanging lamps, collapsible pencils, etc. That pencils, quills, nail files, hammers, and other instruments are undoubtedly male symbols is a fact connected with a connection, a uh, conception of the organ, which likewise is not far to seek. Next come references to flight, a figure for erection, teeth, a particularly remarkable dream symbol is that of having one's teeth fall out or having them pulled. Clothing, the cloak represents a man, perhaps not always the genital aspect. As he starts to warm to his topic, the shoe or slipper is a female genital. Tails and wood, uh, tables and wood have already been mentioned as puzzling but undoubtedly female symbols. Ladders, ascents, steps in relation to their mounting are certainly symbols of sexual intercourse. The breasts must be included in the genitals and like the larger hemispheres of the female body are represented by apples, peaches, fruits in general. The complicated topography of the female genitals accounts for the fact that they are often represented as scenes with cliffs, water, woods, while the imposing mechanism of the male sex apparatus leads to the use of all manner of very complicated machinery difficult to describe. So reading Freud's litany of sexually charged dreams, dream images alongside Nabokov's signs and symbols, one wonders if Catherine White's proposed but rejected subtitle for the tale 
a holiday excursion into the gloomy precincts of the modern psychiatric novel was not so far off the mark after all, for all of these symbols are liberally sprinkled throughout Nabokov's conspicuously tripartite tale. For in it one reads how the underground train, a piece of Freudian complicated machinery, lost its life current. How the father first opens and then closes his umbrella, sticks, umbrellas, poles, etc. How the son's gesture is crucially misunderstood as attempted flight. There is a laborious stair climb. He walked up to the third landing. He sat down on the steps. A scene of tooth removal, straining the corners of his mouth with a horrible mask-like grimace. He removed his new hopelessly uncomfortable dental plate and severed the long tusks of saliva connecting him to it. There is a vision of cliffs an idyllic landscape with rocks on a hillside. We have blossoms, mangled flowers, a coat, wearing over his nightgown the old overcoat with astrakhan collar. A family member nicknamed the prince. In our families, we refer to our children as princes, the eldest as the crown prince. Paper, tables, books, Freud symbols for women, also make their appearances in the references to playing cards, to the photo album, to the threatening wallpaper, and indeed even to the, the labels on the fruit jellies themselves. When the telephone rings for the first time, the father is engaging in a complicated dance with his slipper. His left slipper had come off and he groped for it with his heel and toe as he stood in the middle of the room and childishly, toothlessly gaped at his wife. And as he develops his plan to rescue their son, the father muses that knives would have to be kept in a locked drawer. And finally, of course, we have the 10 fruit jellies themselves, apricot, grape, beech plum, quince, crab apple. Fruit does not stand for the child, but for the breasts, as avers Freud. If anyone suffers from referential mania, it would seem to be Freud himself. Freud, for whom, at least in this prop popular address, Every individual comes equipped with unconscious knowledge of these symbol relationships, all of which turn around and around the same universal theme of sex and repression. However comical Freud's, uh, sorry, however comical Nabokov's Freudian impression, however, if signs and symbols were simply Nabokov's joke at the expression of Freud's uh, dream symbolism, there would be little cause for it to occupy the place that it does within his, his own oeuvre. Waspishly, Nabokov rejected White's query about his possible parodic intentions, responding in his letter of July 15, 1947, quote, I'm afraid I do not understand to what modern psychoanalytic novels you refer unless they are my own, for I do not read much fiction. Given the story's primacy in Nabokov's oeuvre, Nabokov even commented that it was an old favorite of his, it demands another look. But I suggest this not because critics have simply failed to find the encrypted message woven into or placed behind the first semi-transparent story, leaving open once more the possibility of a completed transmission which is to say, the possibility of a reading authorized by a referential order of signification. If its overdetermined title suggests signs and symbols as a self-reflexive theorization of Nabokov's theory of aesthetics, the masterpiece of inventiveness that it represents must be sought in another model of meaning production and another model of reading, one that focuses not in what the story says, but in fact, what it does. Now, Freud himself offers a glimpse into what this other model might be. Towards the end of his symbolism in the dream lecture, Freud remarks on a case, on the case of an interesting mental de uh, defective who believed in the existence of a non-representational language. I'm reminded, he comments, of a patient, quote, patient, quote who had imagined a fundamental language of which all these symbolic representations were the remains. Freud's mental defective envisions, envisions a language that evades the gap the linguistic sign introduces. Dissolving distinctions between word presentations and thing presentations, the 
fundamental language does not abstract, but rather every perceptual object becomes saturated with an all-encompassing signifyingness, similar to the dream logic, but on an absolutized scale. All would be dream work in the sense outlined by Freud. For in a dream, things themselves are already structured like a language, as Slavoj Žižek explains. And now this seems to be an accurate description of the perceptual affliction um, of the couple's son in signs and symbols. Phenomenal nature shadows him wherever he goes. Clouds in the staring sky transmit to one another by means of slow signs, incredibly detailed information regarding him. His inmost thoughts are discussed at nightfall in manual alphabet by darkly gesticulating trees. Pebbles or stains or sun flecks form patterns representing in some awful way messages which he must intercept. Everything is a cipher and of everything he is the theme. So referential mania, the diagnosis of the suspiciously named doctor Hermann Brink, is therefore clearly a misnomer for this condition, which is characterized rather by the absence of an external reality, of any referential beyond to which representation might point. In the sun's signifying system, literally anything can become a signifier, and each resultant signifier is both a sign and a symbol carrying the same invariable message. And this is also, as Freud reminds us, the latent meaning of any dream, of everything, he is the theme. As Freud comments, dreams are completely egotistical. Whenever my own ego does not appear in the content of the dream, but only some extraneous person, I may safely assume that my own ego lies concealed by identification behind the other person. So in the sun's short-circuited or paranoid signifying system, signifiers and signified slide effortlessly, frictionlessly into each other. Representational language collapses in on itself as a multimedia sensoria where literally any object, clouds, trees, pebbles, shadows, is potentially legible. Proto-linguistic forms erupt from the phenomenal world in an archi-cinematic language of light, dark, and motion. And what then becomes recognizable as letters and words would simply be the off-cuts, off the debris thrown out centripetally from the rotations of this all-encompassing formalization. However, there can be no hierarchical organization here. None of the structure provided by representational models of language is possible in a signifying regime where everything is a cipher of itself. The letter always reaches its destination because everything is a receptor of everything else, the receiver identical to the sender and the message always the same. Hi, it's me. As he fixates on, hypnotized by the hypertextuality of every particular, the couple's son therefore seems an exemplary reader of Nabokov. For like him, Nabokov is preternaturally alert to the intrications of form and its latent legibil legibilities in the phenomenal world. So in his autobiography, Speak Memory, for example, Nabokov describes how as a constipated child, he would obsessively quote, unravel the labyrinthine frets on the linoleum and find faces where a crack or a shadow afforded a point de repere for the eye. And there's another aspect as well that the sons and Nabokov's perceptual regime seem to share. I'm talking of course about Nabokov's well-known penchant for self-referentiality, his characteristic self-inscriptions into his texts. For like Alfred Hitchcock, with whom he shares an uncanny visual resemblance, Nabokov notoriously worms his way into his writings, twanging the fourth wall with his cameo presences, most famously in butterflies and moths, whose wing beats mimic the initials of his name. Such signatures, as Dilla Durantai ba baptizes them, are connected in the critical tradition with an image of Nabokov as an arch-auteur. 
their self-citational structure denotes, in Durantai's words, principally the conscious and willed fact of their signing. But again, I want to ask if a trap has been set for us in this authorial figure, who, mesmerizing critics from the beginning, circulates in the critical tradition as the ultimate referent of Nabokov's work. Posing as Nabokov, the godlike creator, whose machinations are dimly perceived by his characters, this persistent extra-dimensional presence reveals, as D. Barton Johnson puts it, the absolute supremacy of the artist over his art. Yet perhaps this Nabokov has only been one more illusory shape in the Hall of Mirrors that comprises this master of deceptions oeuvre. Is Vladimir Nabokov simply another mask, one that secretly upends the logic of referentiality that it purports to guarantee? For is it not instead that by insinuating the existence of secret messages hidden in his texts, by inviting us to find what the sailor has hidden, Nabokov lures us into a double bind, one which no act of reading, no matter how virtuosic or inventive, can defend against. If a number of readers have already sensed something of a trap in signs and symbols, the wider implications become stark when one reads the tale against this habitual backdrop of an all-controlling Nabokov. For what happens, what occurs, is a sort of ontological gear shift, an inversion of positions that sees the reader transformed into an acutely filial son, perpetually on the lookout for the author's ciphered theme. Inscribing us as his paranoid readers in advance, Nabokov therefore literally writes us into his textual universe as it spins out from this, his old favorite tale. Which is also to say that in our obsessive flushing out of the signs of his work's ultimate symbol, Vladimir Nabokov, we find ourselves transformed into referential maniacs, imprisoned within the author's signifying regime, a performative appropriation of identity that would stage us as characters inside Nabokov's hermetic discursive universe. Like a faulty telephone connection that reroutes all outgoing home, uh, calls to home, we then would be the third caller, the ones who, in a truly breathtaking gesture of Nabokov's power and control, are conscripted as operators to loop the tail back in upon itself, thereby completing the author's message to self. So if reading Nabokov in the sense of deciphering a second order meaning is foreclosed in advance by the author's absolute usurpation of the reader's role, if the openings of every symbolic interpretation are permanently diverted, pulled around to debouche at a Vladimir Nabokov, who in preceding us has already anticipated them, are we then to understand this as the second main story that the fantastically egotistical Nabokov has encoded into his tale? As tempting as this conclusion may be, my suspicion is that it is not the whole story. And my sense is based not only on the fact that a warning is given in the tale against a too rapid understanding of what is at stake, where the boy's previous masterpiece of inventiveness was misread by an envious fellow inmate who, <laughs> believing, believing the boy was learning how to fly, prevented what the hospital staff brightly interpreted as yet another suicide attempt. For it seems also that such a solution would miss something fundamental to Nabokov's aesthetic waver, wager, which is the chance, as he puts it in speak memory, for mortality, quote, to peer beyond its own limits from the mast, from the past and its castle tower resonating in signs and symbols as the sun's desire to tear a hole in the world and escape, both Nabokov and the sun pro propose some sort of intervention in the spatial and temporal structure of the world. Indeed, such a solipsistic, even psychotic solution 
would suggest what I think is a too close identification of Nabokov with that other supreme egotist of modern literature, of course, James Joyce. For, although Joyce, along with Proust and Kafka, was named by Nabokov as one of the three greats of modern literature, I will suggest that what lends Nabokov's project its unique performativity is something that does not devolve to a writer's private language laced with so many topical puns, int uh, sorry, topical allusions, intralinguistic puns, fragments of found language, etc., that it would take scholars centuries to decode. Nabokov and Joyce clearly share a mutual fascination with multi-sensory phenomena, with the ways that overflowing both signs and symbols language is shot through with a moire pattern of phonographimatic inscription that interferes with its transmission as a medium of communication. Nevertheless, the immortality that Nabokov seeks through his writing represents, in my view, a more audacious claim than what may be gained by the navel-gazing of an idiotically sly novelist. We recall that James famously wrote that James, sorry, James Joyce famously wrote, I've put in so many enigmas and puzzles that it will keep the professor busy for centuries arguing over what I meant, and that's the only way of ensuring one's immortality. If in Signs and Symbols, this claim, this claim of immortality, is mediated through the communications technologies of the early 20th century, it's to highlight something about language's own technicity that exceeds the self-enclosed, the masturbatory and tautological dimension of language that in Lacan's estimation limits Joyce's work. Which is also to say that there is an opening gained from the exigencies of a wrong number that surpasses the controlling power of authorial will. Signs and Symbols ends with the father, elated with his plan to rescue his son from the hospital. As the couple sit down to their unexpected festive midnight tea, the father puts on his glasses and begins to spell out the fruit jelly's eloquent labels. Now let us follow his lead and spell out these letters along with him, recalling that the rotary telephone dial contains both numerical and alphabetical signs. I've just got an image uh, again of the old rotary dial showing how the, the numbers also have a lateral uh, kind of memnonic. These, these alphabetical signs that accompany the numerical symbols were designed as memnonic devices, aids for memorizing the arbitrary sequence of phone numbers by tran transcoding them into recognizable words. But in spelling out the, the fruit jelly's eloquent labels, following the father's lead, one immediately falls into a problem because whereas apricot and grape and beech plum readily transcode into dialable numbers, which one can read as 27774268472273 and 23324 this is the transcoding into letters spelling out um, into numbers the apricot, grape, and beech plum, we stumble when we get to quince because there's no Q on the old rotary dial. But despite this occlusion from the representational system, despite its occlusion from the dial, the Q nevertheless mobilizes in another fashion. For as one discovers in a quick internet search, in manual alphabet, the Q is shaped by pointing the index finger downwards. This is the manual alphabet letter for Q. So the Q mobilizes in another fashion. As one discovers in the manual alphabet, the letter Q is shaped by pointing the in index finger downward, that is, in the very gesture that one makes when dialing a number. So in this repetitive, circular gesture of dialing a number, a letter is called forth. And this letter, Q, must be set against both the sign and the symbol, 
designating in this case not a confusion of letters and numbers, that is the O misread as a zero, a hermeneutic mistake, but a gap in the representational field, what Lacan would call a true whole. And as a whole, it resists transcoding, if by this we understand a one-to-one -one pairing of signifying units, going from numbers to letters. Once called into being through the body's three dimensions, this Q cannot simply be transcoded back into the two-dimensionality of either a sign or a symbol. Literally, a knot, the Q ties off the endless metonymies of the signifying chain. The Q disconnects, and what it finally disconnects from is language's intrinsic self-referentiality, its tautological structure, that, leaving no space for an absence of sense, can only crystallize into the total signifyingness of the sun's dense tangle of logically interacting illusions. Now, when Lacan, in his own discussion of signs and symbols in Seminar 2, raises the question of the difference between imaginary and symbolic representation, it's by way of the figure of the cycloid, the cycloid is a repeating pattern formed by a point on a wheel as it cycles over the ground. Lacan observes how, from the perspective of the, of the imaginary, this pattern cannot be perceived because it, because it is not available to intuitive apprehension. There are no wheels in nature. The cycloid, cycloid he says, is a true discovery ex nihilo, a discovery of the symbolic. As such, the cycloid offers Lacan a means of demonstrating how structure may be invisibly in play, exerting an off-stage influence beyond intuitional or imaginary models. And we begin to see, perhaps, why this might be of particular interest to Nabokov, whose extra-literary interests are well known. Operating in language somewhat like a finger stop of the telephone dial, this cue, as a hidden principle of direction, also sets in play an ordered register of turns. That is to say, the notion of scansion that turns out to have in interesting properties. Now, the analogy is with the emerging science of cybernetics. Stephen Blackwell has shown that Nabokov's range of scientific interests went well beyond his expertise in biological systems. And from certain observations that Nabokov makes in his lectures on Chekhov, Blackwell concludes that Nabokov had been closely following developments in the new physics throughout the 1920s and 30s. Although excluded from Blackwell's study, it seems quite possible too then that Nabokov, ardent creator of chess problems, would have encountered the work on computation, information theory, and game theory that began appearing in the late 1930s and 1940s, including in the same year that Signs and Symbols were, was published, the publication of Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine, and, which appeared in 1948, and also Alan Turing's Intelligent Machinery, also from 1948, the year of Signs and Symbols. <clears throat> But if Nabokov's reading in this field cannot be assumed, we nevertheless know that Lacan was demonstrably interested in cybernetics. In the 1955 lecture titled Psychoanalysis and Cybernetics or on the Nature of Language, referred to above, Lacan invokes a certain independence in the chain of possible com combinations of absence and presence. An extra subjective agency also forms the basis of his analysis of Poe's The Purloined Letter. In it, one recalls how Lacan reflects on a series of chance events, such as coin tosses, which generate certain patterns once they've been recorded in certain ways, as, for example, in triplets or overlapping pairs. These patterns register, as it were, a memory of past events, representing a sort of archaic structure or law that prevents certain combinations in the future from occurring. 
And what interests is what happens next. In an intriguing, complex couple of essays on the suite of exercises that Lacan appends to his seminar on the purloined letter, the, computational, uh, the computer scientist S. Berlin Branham details the results of the computational process by which a series of binary events, such as the pluses and minuses of the, the, of the coin toss, which is when one can also think of as the simple fort da of the mother's comings and goings, become transcoded into numbers, one, two, three, the triplets of these, these uh, binary um, outcomes, transcoded into these numbers, one, two, three, which then become, in their turn, transcoded into letters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. This is Branham's description of what took place when she worked Lacan's computational model beyond the point where he had left off in his appendix to the, to the seminar too. I let the model run, investigating its productions until it generated the letter code, whereupon I created a virtual reset point. Thereafter, I systematically repeated runs of letters, first for two time steps, then for three, and so on, tracking the patterns that emerged as all possible strings of a given length were punctuated by a halt. Surprisingly, beginning at time three, some letters that had appeared at a previous time step completely disappeared when strings were halted at a later time, and variations of this disappearing act continued for as long as letters were added and strings were halted. Now if, as Branham explains, Lacan's chief interest in cybernetics at this early point in his teaching is to demonstrate the subject's determinism by formal language, it's another aspect of the result that would be considerably more interesting to Nabokov. For it seems that in this simple act of transcoding, something, it, it, the simple act of transcoding causes, as it were, something odd to occur. Something happens when switching from binary inscription to number and then to letter. There invariably comes to be a doubling up, which is the function of what Lacan calls the two-sidedness in the letter. And it's this doubleness, the two separate pathways that the letter can take, whether towards the symbolic or towards the real, that can create a halt in the chain. And as Branham explains, the halt that this produces causes a rewrite of past sequences. Had Lacan continued to follow the chain of letters, the codes would have revealed to him not only the evolution of one special moment at time four, when retroactive holes open up, producing a certain caput mortuum of the signifier, but at another time five, a moment that rewrites the past by erecting at time three a single letter signifier. I discovered, in other words, that a halt, an interruption of the chain, always produces a retro retroactive effect that opens up a hole in the past. The question is whether this rearrangement of the patterns resulting from these holes represents some sort of message. Some sort of message that devolves neither to the encrypted meaning of an intentional subject, nor to a ghostly communication from the other world that Dolinen and others have postulated. It supposes a message, a wrong number, but never calling an error from the real. In Nabokov, just as much as in Freud and Lacan, as Eric Neumann has convincingly demonstrated, the real persistently dials in with its perverse message which is to say, a letter about jouissance, a form of enjoyment that constitutively evades the paternal prohibition represented by the Ur father's central forelimb. So in closing here, readers familiar with Lacan's seminar on Joyce will recall how Joyce is said to sign his texts with his saint homme, the combination of the letters of his name that supplements his Borromean knot of the, imaginary, ima, sorry, of the symbolic imaginary and the real. Lacan maintains that it is through this fourth ring, 
designated by the square bracket of his ego or name that Joyce sustains the connection among all three registers in the face of his missing name of the father. Creating a saint arm of his name shields him from his latent psychosis. And for Nabokov too, his proper name is the privileged site of a signature effect, a signing of the ego or I, which serves to link the symbolic to the imaginary and to the real. Yet I'd like to suggest that in Nabokov's case, the lateral patterns engendered by his anagrammatic origami are not invoked for the false immortality bestowed by the university discourse and its critical hunting parties, rather something like a radical intervention into time and consequently mortality is at stake when a whole in representation is produced as a consequence of being written or spelled out with letters. It is from writing, Lacan maintains, that true wholes or knots emerge. There is no topology without writing. So how then is one to read Nabokov? I suggest it's by working Nabokov, which is to say by taking him literally, literally, one puts into place the conditions under which a halt in the signifying chain can occur. It requires spelling out the eloquent labels of his signatures to enable something irreducibly singular to come to light. But if this potential is always the product of what Nabokov in Speak Nem Memory calls chance, it now appears that chance is never purely random when letters are in play. There is a signifying finality, as Lacan puts it, behind every error or lapsus. Nabokov gambles that spiraling the letters of his ultimate symbol, Vladimir Nabokov, will be the combination that tears open the space-time dimensions of the world, a teletechnic envoy, as Tom Cohen has put it, of a different memnonic or material time. If one can risk naming this the Nabokovian unconscious, it also suggests that Nabokov's real relation to psychoanalysis has yet to be read. Thank you very much.